Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. We've talked a lot about civil asset forfeiture on this channel, and that's the idea that when the police encounter you and you've got cash on you or something else of value, they just take it from you and say, you know, we think this is the product of a crime or somehow being used in a crime or whatever, and we're just going to take it from you. And if you want your stuff or your money back, you have to sue us. And because you're filing a lawsuit against them, and it's going to be involved in civil litigation, it's called civil asset forfeiture. And I've talked about the distinction between criminal asset forfeiture, which most people agree with, that if somebody got busted who'd been committing crimes and made profits from those crimes, or just what they stole, for instance, that if they got convicted, they should, of course, have to give back the money they made by committing the crimes. That's criminal asset forfeiture, okay? So we got a story right here sent to me by both Barry and Harriet out of Oregon. Uh, Wweek.com published it, and it says catalytic converter kingpin wants his cash back. So we're talking about criminal asset forfeiture here, at least in theory. Uh, the man says the money in his lake house safe wasn't part of any illicit enterprise. So he's saying, look, whether I did something criminal or not, the money in my safe at my beach house <laughs> had nothing to do with that. Uh, you'll have a hard time making that argument because no one's going to believe you, but it's a decent argument on some level. Lucas Manfield wrote this. The man at the center of the story is 32 years old, uh, and for some odd reason they mention he's a former Uber driver. Uh, I'm not sure why that's relevant to the story. Um, it'd be kind of like if you saw a story about Steve Lato, and it said, Steve Lato, former tow truck driver, blah, 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 blah. Like, I mean, it's true, but <laughs> I don't know why that would be relevant. But it says here the 32-year-old man's a former Uber driver who prosecutors say became the ringleader of a $20 million Lake Oswego-based catalytic converter trafficking ring. They say he wants his money back. And Lake Oswego is, of course, in Oregon, uh, as are many of the place names I'm about to tell you about. So police raided his rental home on the shore of Oswego Lake last August, seizing nearly $40,000 in cash, as well as two computers and an iPad. That followed a months-long investigation of the operation, which sold 40,000 allegedly stolen catalytic converters to East Coast buyers. The man was arrested and charged with racketeering. Now, uh, I suppose it's possible that somebody could have 40,000 catalytic converters that weren't stolen, but in this day and age, it seems to be that that might be what we're talking about here. Now, he's working on a Vancouver, Washington car lot, according to court files. Late last year, his attorney petitioned Washington County Circuit Court to return the money that was taken from the lake house arguing the police couldn't prove it was contraband or illegal proceeds. So the police detectives disagree, and they've recently filed legal documents backing up their claims the cash was going to be used to finance the purchase of stolen catalytic converters, and they charged the man with 30 new counts of unlawful scrap dealing based on new evidence seized during the raid. So they did grab two Apple computers and an iPad, and I suspect they're going to say they found information on those devices indicating some sort of plan and working with other people, hence the racketeering allegations. They say that the man paid his childhood friend to do the actual buying and selling of the catalytic converters. They claim that uh, that's what's going on really here, and that uh, that's the man who lived in the lake house with this particular person and was overheard on a wiretap talking with a potential seller about needing to get money from the safe. So... <laughs> The police are going to say that he's discussing a deal and needing to get money from the safe. So if the money from the safe is being used in this transaction, then it's not the proceeds of a criminal activity, but it's being used in a criminal activity. According to an affidavit filed earlier this month by Beaverton Police Detective Patrick McNair, Doyle and his associates used a Chase bank account registered to uh, an LLC that one of them owned. Photos included in the affidavit show that uh, the housemate, Business associate and childhood friend was withdrawing money from that bank account. Cash was then brought to the lake house safe and used to pay middlemen for stolen catalytic converters, according to detectives. The catalytic converters were then sold to a New York buyer, police claim, and the proceeds wired back to the LLC account to pay for them. Uh, the buyer turned around, resold the scrap to two brothers in New Jersey, uh, and uh, they themselves are currently fighting uh, these charges over there, according to an indictment 
Meanwhile, uh, the two in New Jersey were released by a judge last year, but California prosecutors are trying to return them to custody, arguing that the two are driving and enabling a market that has become gang-controlled and deadly. So they say that these guys are out on parole, but they're or, uh, they're out on bail, but um, they're still up to no good, according to California prosecutors. A middleman, an associate, of them was overheard on a wiretap saying he was picking up a load of catalytic converters from a Mexican cartel. Let's put it like this. The Mexican cartels love me, he said, according to prosecutors. <laughs> Back in Oregon, the uh, organization there remains the only alleged trafficking ring busted by law enforcement, even though police detectives say several operations of similar size continue to steal and ship catalytic converters. So here's the situation. This very well could be framed or couched as a civil asset forfeiture in the courts of Oregon. I'm not exactly sure. I suspect that's what they did. That is, they just took the money, said, you want it, you got to sue us to get it back. But I've always said that this is the kind of situation where they ought to do it as criminal asset forfeiture. That is, you seize the money and you say, in essence, that the money is evidence of a crime and you're going to use it in court as evidence of a crime. During the prosecution of the case... You proceed, and if you get a conviction, you would then hang on to the jury and ask them another couple questions. And the questions would be, after hearing all of the evidence involving everything in this case, was that money either the fruit of, you know, the product of, or about to be used in a crime? And and was that proven in court? Was the evidence proven in court to show that money was either the product of a crime or going to be used in a crime? And if you believe that to be true, then you will answer this question. And at that point, the state would be allowed to take the money and say, yes, it's going to be forfeited as a criminal asset forfeiture. I suspect this is still a civil asset forfeiture the way it's actually been done with the paperwork. And I suspect that's because it's easier for them to do it that way. But some states have said that to do this, if you're alleging a crime, you got to prove the crime. And that's one of the primary reasons so many people have problems with civil asset forfeiture, is that in America, you're supposed to be allowed to defend yourself and people coming after you have got to prove things to a certain standard. And so when someone takes your money and says, no, you sue us and you prove to us your own innocence, most people go, okay, that's wrong. That's wrong. So like I said, this is the kind of case where I wish instead of treating it like civil asset forfeiture, I wish they treat it like criminal asset forfeiture, but I have a feeling that that's not what they're doing simply because it's easier to do it as civil asset forfeiture. But the key here is that the guy has been accused of running this ring. During the uh, arrest and the seizure of a lot of stuff, they seized iPads and computers and a safe that had a bunch of money in it. And they're saying that money was being used by this operation to fund these transactions. And so that's their allegations why they're going to keep the money. But the guy wants his money back. The weird thing about this, and, and I've, <laughs> I hate to point this out, every time I mention catalytic converters, I get at least one person who goes, um, this whole thing's a hoax. Catalytic converters don't have any value at all. No, This is just vandalism. Um, apparently, they've got so much value that if you find somebody who steals one in Oregon, you can pay him for it and then flip it to a middleman who will pay you for it. And then he'll flip it to somebody else who'll pay him for it. And these things change hands so many times, apparently, that there is money to be made. Because obviously, if the catalytic converter has street value of $1, it's not like someone's going to say, okay, okay, I'll flip this thing to you for 25 cents. And you can flip it for 50 cents. And then someone else can buy it from you for them from 75 cents. And then at the end, someone will get a dollar from it. No, no, that's obviously not what's happening here. So there must be enough money in this for this to make sense to operate at this level with these kinds of numbers. So it's a scary concept. Uh, the catalytic converter theft to me drives me crazy when I think about it because it is so horribly wasteful. It's wasteful. Uh, anytime you look at a transaction and you ask yourself, what did everyone pay for this transaction? Okay, so somebody steals a catalytic converter and puts it in the stream of what I just described. And they make a couple bucks, and down the road someone else makes a few more bucks, and so on and so forth. But usually, the cost to repair the car the catalytic converter is taken from is much, much more than what these people are making in these exchanges selling it. And so it is net wasteful for society. 
So we've got to crack down hard on this and see if we can't put an end to it. I've seen people suggest that they put the VIN, the vehicle identification numbers, on the catalytic converters uh, or something like that. And that's not a bad idea. Uh, some kind of, of identifier uh, because it is a part that you know does apparently get stolen quite a bit. So as of right now, we're going to see what happens. But from wweek.com, I guess it's williametweek.com, uh, Oregon, uh, that's where the story's from, Barry and Harriet sent it to me. But the catalytic converter kingpin, what they call him, wants his cash back and says the cash had nothing to do with anything he's alleged to have done. There you go. Questions or comments, put them below. Let's talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Lato's Law. Make time for people who need help, regardless of whether they are friends or not.